So, my name is Johan Jensen uh, and I work at a company called Spotify. And uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for being invited to this conference. It's my third year in a row that I'm in uh, Latvia. So, I know I met some of you earlier at the Agile Riga Day. And it's uh, great to be here again, so thank you. So the topic of my talk is Agile at Scale and Spotify. But first, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Spotify. How many here know what Spotify is? Okay, I don't really tell you that much. It's, uh, we're all about the right music for every moment. We want everyone to be able to listen to, to free music everywhere in the world at any time, any platform, any device. We want to make music available to people. And uh, more than five years ago, six years ago, our two founders uh, tried to pitch this idea to the record labels. And they said, oh, no way, you're crazy. This is never going to happen. And they spent about two years uh, on airplanes going back and forth trying to convince people. Uh, but today it's, uh, it's happening. And it's uh, been a great journey. Because today we have uh, over 24 million active users, over 6 million paying subscribers, and over 20 million songs that you can listen to. And we're adding about 20,000 everyday new songs. And can you guess how many record labels we have uh, deals with? Anyone? Five. Five? Five. <laughs> A little bit more than seven. 300,000 labels, more than 300,000 labels. So you get the picture that you have to go back and forth on, on many other things to, to talk to all of them. But have, uh, luckily you don't have to talk to every individual label, but uh, that gives you a, a picture of how complicated this can be. And we also have over 1 billion playlists. So we have a really, really big system handling a lot of traffic and a lot of users. And uh, we're available in over 28 countries, uh, including Latvia, of course. So three and a half years ago, in January 2010, we were about uh, 30 engineers sitting in an office in Stockholm. Uh, three years later, we're 250 engineers in Stockholm, 30 in Gothenburg. That's Gothenburg. It looks old. Oh, I have to. That's Gothenburg. Uh, 13 engineers in Gothenburg, 100 in New York, and uh, a small office in San Francisco with uh, 10 engineers. So we've been gro growing awfully fast. So why do we grow so fast? Is it because we want to be a big company? No, we, we want to change the world and change the way people listen to music. And we have lots of ideas that we want to get out there, and we want to get them out as fast as possible. And to do that, we need a development speed that scales. We need to be able to grow without slowing down. Uh, we need to continuously improve to, to keep the rate of, of the development speed up. Because uh, a lot of companies that grow uh, lose productivity. And we try to find ways of avoiding that. And we believe that autonomy is uh, a way to achieve that. So that's the single most important principle for our organizational design. We want to hire really passionate and great people and uh, let them use their passion and creativity and, and their skills and try to create an environment that uh, encourage, the, encourage them to do that. And the most important piece of the organizational design is the autonomous squad. And it's supposed to feel like a me startup to be working in that. And it's come to my attention that when some people hear startup, they think about uh, uh, really bad conditions, uh, working overtime, with bad salaries, and a uh, stressful job. But that's not what we mean. It's, it's the good stuff. Uh, imagine like uh, a bunch of good friends with a great idea sitting in a garage uh, and uh, uh, really working closely together and uh, collaborating and, and influencing everyone able to influence the direction on equal terms. 
So we have this squad, it's a small uh, five to seven engineers, always less than ten, self-organizing, cross-functional, everyone needed to, to bring the ideas to, to life uh, should be in the team. And they have a mission that is uh, stable over time and they uh, are uh, free to decide what and how to achieve that mission. Examples for, for squads and missions is uh, we have the What's New Squad. They are, their mission is to build the best, what's, the best thinkable uh, What's New page. Uh, we have one team handling the playback experience, uh, which is, uh, you could think that that's a solved problem, right? But uh, keeping the, the really, really low latency, quickly starting a track, uh, the playlist and so on, when we move into new markets, it's, uh, it's a difficult challenge. Uh, Arvid told me yesterday that Sweden has the, the fastest uh, internet connection in the world and Latvia is uh, number three, I think, so you're pretty good here. But when we move into countries like uh, Mexico and start looking at Africa and so on, that's not the case. <coughs> and, uh, well, mobile phone. And this is uh, also to show that uh, the squads this squad is, is uh, in charge of uh, search, and that means that you're responsible for the search experience on every device and every platform. Uh, so if you want search to be available on the iOS platform, you have to build that too. Okay, so this is a, a picture from our office. Uh, we tried to build an office that uh, uh, really uh, makes this uh, organizational form easier. So the squads have their uh, small uh, squad rooms. Uh, you can't fit more than 10 people in them, then you have to split the squad. Uh, and it's uh, closed off but yet open, because we want to encourage people to stop by and, and uh, talk to each other, but uh, at the same time let people focus. And every room also has its own uh, uh, lounge, so we never need to book a meeting room or, or uh, to have a planning or a retrospective or, or a whiteboard discussion, and we have whiteboard walls so we can draw on any wall, and small meeting rooms so uh, if you don't want to do a one-on-one -on -one or a um, phone call. And we try to also, uh, we build these spaces where people can actually meet. Uh, in Sweden we have a popular meeting form called FICA, I don't know if you have a similar thing in Latvia, but, uh, or in the other countries that are represented here. But basically you have some coffee and uh, some sweets and you just talk. And uh, we try to have a lot of meetings like that, that's uh, voluntarily and uh, where people can actually meet from different parts of the organization to exchange ideas, exchange ideas and so on. So uh, one big part of being autonomous is uh, to have a process that fits your team. You can choose how you want to work. We used to be pretty much a scrum shop. Uh, years back when we were smaller, uh, but uh, that wasn't a good fit for, for every tweet team. And when we started to uh, grow and uh, talk a lot about autonomy, it made sense that uh, squads can choose how they want to work. And we used to have uh, like three week iterations with a, a shared demo and so on, but now with 50 squads, uh, that's just not possible anymore. But I did a quick uh, tour of the offices and talked to 35 of our squads, just asked them, so what kind of method are you working with, would you say? And uh, about 11 said Scrum, uh, about 16 said Kanban, and uh, well, and we have nine uh, teams who said Kanban-esque, that's, they say, I don't, I'm not sure, but something like Kanban. Uh, and some people ask, well, if you're asking, I wouldn't say we're doing Kanban, because I know you won't agree, but to everyone else I say we are doing Kanban, so... And they ended up in the Kanban-esque column. And then we have three teams that said, I don't know, but we're probably a bad example for the rest of the company. <laughs> and uh, we take the autonomy seriously, and we want to uh, really uh, help the squads to be autonomous, uh, so we have set up a, a few criteria what that means or what you need to, to, to be autonomous. First of all, you should have a dedicated product owner that, can, uh, that sits with you all the time and works with only your squad. He's a squad member 
uh, with business uh, business value expertise, so to speak. Uh, and uh, you should have an agile coach that uh, works with you to help you uh, uh, to improve your, your process and your way of working. And uh, you should be able to influence your work. If you can't decide what you're uh, going to work on and how to fulfill your mission, something is wrong. It should also be easy to release independently of all the other squads and we take uh, we go to, to great lengths to uh, actually build an architecture that's really loosely coupled and service based so teams can be as independent as possible of each other. And the process that fits the team as I mentioned, it should also have a clear mission and so it's easy for when people come and say, oh, you have two web devs, can't you do this? No, that's, we, we would love to help you, but that's not our mission. You should probably be looking at, uh, at another team, and if you can't find one, well, here's an opportunity to start a new one with a new mission. And uh, every squad should feel that they have organizational support, both proactively uh, from higher level management and uh, people operations and so on but also that they should always know who to go to uh, to get help uh, or to raise issues. And we do uh, uh, continuously survey the state of, of autonomy in squads uh, as a means to help uh, uh, reinforce like this is how we want to work and this is what you could be doing. Uh, if you're not there, uh, we want to help you. What actions can you take to, to get closer to the ideal and, and what do we need to change in the organization or how can we support you? We do this uh, uh, twice a year and uh, we put uh, everything uh, together, we look at patterns, if there's something in particular that uh, we seems to be doing bad at, so then we can, maybe we need a bigger company initiative to, to help support the squads. But it's not like this is what you have to do. It's a tool for the squads to be working on continuously improving. Like you say, yeah, we, we know we, we don't have a dedicated product owner. That's not working really well now. But we have uh, bigger issues that we'd rather focus on. But we're always there to be able to help them. And uh, we'll get the, the question how a new squad is born. And there are several different ways. Uh, one is uh, through evolution. Uh, since we grow so fast, it's very common that uh, uh, a squad starts to uh, um, maybe get so much to do that you can really see that there are two missions in the squad and you can tease them apart uh, and suddenly you have new squads with uh, more specialized missions from, the, uh, from what was uh, recently one mission. Another way is revolution. We recently merged uh, infrastructure with operations in kind of a DevOps uh, initiative. Uh, and then they organized the whole new department in, uh, uh, after product features for that new uh, cooperation. And then, uh, so we're now looking into, we've identified all those areas together, all the engineers and the management. And uh, now we're going to let everyone choose which squad they want to work with uh, within that. And uh, also, sometimes we uh, come up with ideas for what we want to do. Uh, typically, uh, maybe an engineer uh, does it during a hack day. We have hack days so about every third week where you can work on whatever you want to. And we also have uh, hack weeks uh, twice a year where uh, the whole company uh, works together in any way they want on, on their own projects or whatever they want to do. And sometimes their ideas come from that direction or from product management and we try to work in a small team to figure out if this is a viable thing that we should be doing. And then we decide to, yeah, we should probably uh, put some effort into this. Then, uh, Squad is formed and people are uh, people can can apply to get into that squad or we put new people that we're hiring into that. So the the big challenge with uh, autonomy is that we're still one company trying to uh, achieve the same goal. So how do we how do we stay autonomous while uh, getting some kind of alignment? You can say that we have 
divided up into two challenges with growing, and one is how can we structure the organization so that we can actually help each other, learn from each other, uh, uh, make use of economy of scale, uh, consolidation, and, and share uh, good practices and so on, uh, without uh, hindering the autonomy. And the other is how can we align all these autonomous squads uh, to have them uh, work towards the same goal without uh, uh, hindering their autonomy. And this is what the rest of the talk will be about. So first of all, uh, every engineer is uh, for, uh, part of the squad where they do all their daily work, but he's also uh, part of, uh, he or she is al also part of a uh, chapter, which uh, is kind of a special interest group. Uh, that depends on, on the role you have. So if you're a web developer, you're in the web development chapter. If you're a backend developer, there's a backend chapter, a QA chapter, and so on. Uh, it's never more than 10 people. So if we get more than 10 web developers, we start another chapter and another chapter, and so on. And you meet to share knowledge within your special interest uh, and uh, see if there are opportunities to, to consolidate and, uh, oh, you're also using some packaging tool, but we're using a different one. Maybe would it make sense that we use the same one? Do we have any benefits from that? Uh, looking at how can we, what are our big technical challenges that we need to be solving together uh, so we don't have local optimization that leads to global sub-optimization. And they typically meet once a week to discuss these different things. And every chapter is led by a chapter lead, and uh, that's a servant leader whose role is to make sure that um, this chapter is working, that they have regular meetings, that they, they are uh, doing all the things I just mentioned. But he's also, or she, is also the hiring manager of everyone in that chapter. So they recruit, they, they set salaries or together with, with the employees, and they have one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching with each individual in the chapter every week. They sit down together and talk about how can you, how can you grow as an individual? How can you come further on your, on your, on your journey to, to mastering? And uh, the engineer, that's your chapter, he's a hiring manager, is, uh, if you're a web dev, he's, just, he's a web dev just like you. But he, he usually spends 50% of the time uh, doing chapter lead things and 50% of the time to work in, in uh, squads. We also uh, spend a lot of focus on, on personal development to make sure that you have, a, you have a career path that's not just about management. We don't have any senior developer, or senior engineer or anything. We just have engineers. Uh, but now with the, the personal development program, we try to find ways to make it uh, safe to fail, I almost said, but rather to... Um, one problem with the, the management track for, for career paths is that uh, if you're promoted to a, to a manager uh, and you decide, no, this is not for me, it's often seen as a failure. But we try to uh, have a model where you do these add-ons. So for one year, maybe you try the add-on of, of being a chapter lead. Uh, and if you go back, it's, there's no failure, failure, there's no shame in that. Uh, and I have other add-ons as an expert, teacher, coach. Uh, and you receive uh, special training and have special goals that you want to reach uh, if you take on these other roads. We do a lot of training and knowledge sharing. So, for example, if you're like me, I, I'm a part of the speaker add-on. So I get speaker training and, and uh, get into groups with other people that have speaker, uh, the speaker add-on and, and share experience and, uh, and uh, try to uh, evolve together. We also have a boot camp. So where you, when you start uh, as a new engineer at Spotify, the first week, you do some introductions and tech ramp ups, as we call them, and uh, you work together with other newcomers in a squad. You have a real product owner and an agile coach that uh, works with you, and you have a senior, uh, well, senior in the sense that someone who has worked for a long time at the company sits with you. You get real stuff 
uh, on the backlog that you need to be uh, delivering. So the first week you will be able to put things in production in, in that bootcamp squad, but still uh, as, a, as a learning thing. And so at one point we grow so big, so we realized that uh, we can't, we don't know, we, know, we no longer know each other. I see lots of faces of people that I don't really know who they are. It's getting trickier and trickier to know who to go to when I need help. Uh, each, uh, each chapter lead and the CTO uh, above the chapter lead uh, have more and more direct reports. So uh, we wanted to, well, I guess in a traditional company you would call it, let's get some departments going. Uh, we call it tribes. And it's because of the, our focus for this was, uh, I don't know if you heard about the Dunbar number. It's an anthropologist who, who did a lot of research and discovered that uh, somewhere around 100, 150 people that's the biggest size group where you can actually know everyone in the group. And there's a reason why small communities, villages, units in armies over the centuries have, have uh, been around that size. So we try to divide in, in manageable units in that sense, uh, where everyone has a chance to know who everyone else in the tribe is, uh, and uh, know who to go to for help. So, uh, and we put the tribe lead in charge of that tribe. That's uh, also a servant leader role. He, he, the tribe and the tribe lead, have, uh, their mission is to support the tribe and the squads in the tribe in every uh, sense they can and, and continues to improve the conditions for, for those squads. So it's not like uh, he's making decisions on what you should be working on or, or anything like that. It's just a support organization. So we have about uh, seven of these tribes at the moment. They all have, we try to make them as independent and autonomous as possible. Uh, one of them is, uh, has the mission of providing fast and reliable access in all the world to all the world's music. That's the music player tribe. Uh, another tribe is uh, the one I mentioned, the backend infrastructure. Uh, enable high product development speed while maintaining a highly available service. So they're more of an infrastructure. The, the first one is, is a feature tribe, you could say, and the other is more of an infrastructure tribe where uh, it acts as a, a hub of good practices within Spotify that the other uh, tribes and squads can, can make use of. That's also an important point. We, as I hope you caught by now, we put great value in autonomy and uh, to the extent that if you as a squad don't want to use the services, for example, the infrastructure tribe uh, looks to, if you want to store something for 100 million users, not every squad should be able to have to implement that, uh, that solution. But if a squad thinks that the infrastructure tribe's solution isn't good enough for us, we want to go a different way, they can do that. Uh, and that keeps the uh, in, uh, infrastructure tribe on its toes and they have to be uh, providing the best service to the squads, otherwise they won't use it. And uh, uh, within the tribes we have uh, tribe gatherings and tribe demos. Uh, the more feature, uh, featuresque tribes uh, usually have product demos together. Uh, in the infrastructure tribes there's more of a uh, sharing knowledge and, and meeting regularly uh, and do things together in the tribe. But the boundaries of the tribe are not hard, they're soft. So a lot of collaboration happens uh, between squads in different tribes. And that's uh, not just okay, it's, uh, it's actually encouraged. Uh, if you need to be working in a squad in another tribe, you just do that for a limited time when you need it and then you just stop working together with them. So you don't have to go up and down through any hierarchies or talk to the managers in the other tribe, you just work together. And this creates a kind of a, a networking organization uh, with lots of, of small collaborations going on all the time. But the important thing is that that's no, there's no hard boundaries. 
But one of the things we've tried to achieve with, with the tribe organization and, and putting tribes with uh, autonomy and, and their designed missions together was to avoid dependencies. So uh, we started to actually track uh, what, what was going on. So we, we did a go, went around to all the squads and asked them, so which other squads are you depending on? What does that dependency look like? Is it, uh, uh, is it the information or, or do you have to get your code reviewed by another squad in order to get it into production and so on? And we started tracking that. And what we found was that uh, not all dependencies are bad. It's actually the case if, if, if it's a good dependency, you call it a collaboration. And if it's a bad dependency, it's a dependency. Uh, so uh, currently we're trying to uh, minimize the hard and bad dependencies and encourage more of the collaboration. And several people that are in, when you're new to Spotify and you come in, you see this chaotic organization. And you ask, in which meeting is this decided? By who is this decided? And people say, I don't know. There's no such meeting. There's no such forum. And people are, what? How can you how can you run an organization like this? This is just chaos. But once you've been there a while, you realize that structure happens when it's needed. So for example, with with when some squads are working on similar things or, or needed to need to coordinate within the scope for something bigger, we don't say, okay, now we have to have a scrum of scrums where every involved scrum team have a meeting every week with this and that. But rather we just uh, let it evolve. So in this example where we, this is a team that did our web player, there were five teams involved in, in two different extents in, in that. And uh, they just, okay, let's meet and, and, and see what issues we have to resolve every day. And they invited everyone in all the squads and other, every other interested stakeholder to, to join those meetings. And uh, started handling that. And when they did their first bigger release together, they just stopped doing them. And then they realize, oh, maybe we should be continuing a little bit, then it pops up again, and then it disappears. And uh, also, uh, another example of, wait, you said that I should keep it short, I'll move on. So, uh, uh, one thing that I want to mention is that, uh, also, with the, the, that's the other uh, side of the coin when it comes to autonomy. With autonomy also comes big responsibility. That almost sounds like a Spider-Man quote. With great powers also comes great responsibility. Yeah. That's it. And uh, you're supposed to fix things. Our CTO is constantly nagging about that. And he's uh, written a blog post internally that's called Get Shit Done. So if you see like, well, I think we should do something about diversity, we really need to hire more women. Excellent. Start a task force, uh, talk to other people, just do something. Here's a, here's a bunch of money and use it whatever time you need. Uh, but don't sit around and complain about it. Just do it. Uh, someone should fix this system. Yes, awesome, you should fix it. You don't have to do it yourself, but uh, rather than, than nagging about it, make sure that either you or, or talk to the right people and, and, and get the ball rolling. And uh, one other concern when we went, did the tribes was that uh, how will cross-tribe communication happen? How will web developers in one tribe uh, get to talk to web developers in another one? So we, we started this thing called guilds. So all the web developers in uh, one tribe is also in the same guild as the web developers in all other tribes and exchange uh, uh, knowledge and uh, share good practices and so on. Then we realized that we want people to have fluent roles. We don't want to say, no, you're a web developer, you should only do web development. Uh, so we did uh, change them to be opt-in or opt-out, so you can be a member of, of several guilds if you want to. I'm a member of uh, uh, the Agile Guild and the QA Guild, for example. Uh, and uh, we also started to, when, when things happen uh, where we need to be sharing knowledge, 
uh, we, we start a new field. So for example, uh, we noticed that a lot of squads are really, really good at continuous delivery. Others are struggling. So let's start a continuous delivery field where those who are doing good can actually teach and help those who are struggling. And we also started our Craftsman Guild recently, where we try to uh, keep an inventory of everyone who's uh, into tech practices such as uh, TDD, pair programming, who, so you know, if you want to, if you want help learning, a, picking up a new tech practice, this is the guild you can go to. And the guilds can be everything from a active mailing list uh, to uh, more regular meetings, but all guilds, yeah, actually all guilds have uh, two times or three times a year they get together. Uh, so, for example, this is from the web developer on conference. So they put all the all the web developers from all over the world, New York, San Francisco, Gothenburg, Stockholm, meet for a whole day, do lightning talks and open space. And open space is a very open conference format where you just uh, put up topics and discuss about them. And uh, uh, this makes uh, a lot of new ideas and collaborations uh, are spawned in, in these uh, conferences. And there's usually a great party at the end. So, so um, autonomy and alignment. Some people say that, well, if you're really autonomous, everyone will go in every other direction and you won't achieve any alignment. Uh, we think that's a false dichotomy, and uh, the source for this uh, thinking is uh, Stephen Bunge, apparently. Uh, we think this is the case. You could be a very autonomous organization without alignment. That's the bottom right corner. Then you have an entrepreneurial organization, but with a very chaotic culture. Uh, you can also be a uh, very aligned but not autonomous organization. That's what most people think why it's uh, difficult to, to combine. But we want to strive, there's always the upper left corner, you know, in this diagram. So we want to be there where you have an innovative organization and a collaborative culture. So everyone is striving in the right direction, uh, even though you're uh, left to your own uh, will to, to implement them. But that's take, that takes a lot of focus on alignment. So, so what we do for that is we, we, we make sure that we have a very clear vision and missions. This is our CEO on stage. He, every two or three weeks, we have a town hall where everyone in the world is invited uh, through video conference uh, or physical location, where he addresses the company. And after that, it's a Q&A with all the C-level people, so to speak, the chief product officer and the CTO and the, the, the lead team, basically. And anyone can ask anything. Uh, and there's really, really great transparency, and this is very important. Because have this autonomy working, and everyone knows what's going on, we make every information available as much as we can, and we're totally transparent. Even really, really secret stuff that would hurt us if it leaked to the outside, is uh, uh, spread widely within the company. Everyone is allowed to, to learn about it. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think it's really great to be in an organization. I don't know if you can see it, where our CEO actually addresses the whole company and talks about simplicity, focus, and transparency. So, so it's uh, we're not just agile in our squad level, but we, we believe in these values. It, uh, it's the core of the company. And by the way, we're uh, about 1,100 people at the moment, so, or 1,000 at least. So we're not just engineers. And we also have a product organization. Uh, that's not part of technology, but uh, it's a matching organization. But that's, uh, that's also very important for our alignment efforts, because the product owners report in to the product organization every week. They do a check-in and they update roadmaps and they exchange information about uh, what we call stepping stones, which is uh, dependencies basically. So uh, you can learn about, okay, so you're, you're changing the stepping stones, then I have to adjust my expectations and, and, and so on. So a lot of, of the alignment is, is created in that part of the organization. 
And we also uh, use something called OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. Uh, it's, uh, I think, Intel pioneered that, or Google uses it too. And it's uh, basically that every quarter you set up objective for the company. This is what we want to achieve. Sometimes it goes on for several quarters, uh, and only the key results change. So we have an objective, it could be, well, I, I can't say what we're doing now, but uh, for example, when we did the Facebook, Facebook integration two years back, uh, that was a, a company objective even though it was uh, phrased more in the, the goal we wanted to achieve. And then we had key results like uh, the Facebook integration should be in place by then and that date. We should have uh, that many million users by the end of the quarter and so on. And these are then uh, spread to the rest of the organization. You look at how can I contribute to the OPR, the company OPR. But the company OPR is also informed bottom up. So it's, a, it's an iteration that happens constantly that informs this uh, uh, high-level OKR. And that sometimes you say, well, I work in legal, I have nothing to do with Facebook integration. Well, that's not true, that was a lot of legal stuff. But uh, yeah, that could be like that. So, so then, you, then you will have an OKR that's not related directly to the top objective, but something that's important. Everyone uh, comes up with their OKR together with their, in discussions with their manager and their peers. Except individual engineers, squad members, because they work together in the squad, and then the squad has an OKR for what they want to achieve together. We don't want individuals in the squads to have conflicting goals or anything. Uh, and you, should, you pick the, maybe the three, two or three things where you think that you will have the most impact, something that you can really change or, or add to the company and try to focus on that. And uh, then we do projects from time to time. Well, I think so does everyone, right? But we actually do very, very few projects. We don't even call them projects until we suddenly understand that oh, this is probably a project. So it's not a project in a traditional sense. It's more like when we need to collaborate several teams for... So a big project to us is five teams working together for three months or six months. That's a really big project. So that's also one way that we try to keep autonomy by avoiding big projects. Uh, but from time to time we do, and that also creates uh, coordination and collaboration and, and alignment between different parts of the organization. So does anyone know who that is? Yes, Ringo Starr on the right, but uh, the guy on the left, that's uh, actually Neil Aspinall. He was the uh, road manager for uh, a, a band called The Beatles. Heard about The Beatles? Yeah. They're not on Spotify, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, so, we noticed that while growing so much, with, there's an increased need, of course, for coordination and collaboration. But we don't want project managers, because we don't do projects like that. But we saw that there's often a need for someone to take a bigger responsibility. So for example, Neil Aspinall, when Beatles were doing their first US tour, uh, there was a lot of, of things that need to, to be uh, booked and planned and so on, and the Beatles weren't taking responsibility for it. Uh, so they had this Neil Aspinall, this amazing road manager, who just made sure that everything is planned, give attention to detail, everyone has been contacted, everyone uh, knows what they we know what restaurants we will eat at and what food we will have and so on. And it's a, uh, it's, even though this is a really bad picture, <laughs> because uh, that's not what the role is about, it's more, these are actually better, but it's such a funny picture. This shows that it's a servant leader role, you're supposed to help the organization, and this is our way of uh, putting a label on a, a behavior we want. So when you say that, okay, we, need, we probably need a road manager for this. Everyone knows exactly what you mean. Okay, so if I'm the road manager, I will make sure that every, everyone that we need to, talk, need to talk to, to accomplish this, we talk to. Uh, so nothing fall between the chairs, as we say in Swedish. Uh, and uh, just to get a sense of, of, of what this guy was doing, 
when the Beatles had, had dinner in clubs where it was often uh, a bit dark, uh, when, when the waiter served the food, he pulled out a, a flashlight and, and inspected and said, yeah, that, that's the right food. So, so that's the uh, level of attention to detail and, and the sort of leadership that we expect from a road manager. And this is not a role that you, you have for a long time. You just, it could be for small things and for big things. So for example, let's say, uh, should we have lunch tomorrow? Yeah, great. You can you be the road manager for that. Then I know, okay, I have to make sure to do the invitation, book the restaurant and so on. But after the lunch, I'm not necessarily the road manager for lunches. Uh, until further notice, it was just for that lunch. Then someone else is the next time and so on. So it's a label on a behavior that we need. Uh, we also do a, a lot of uh, post-mortems, and we try to be as open and public and transparent uh, as possible uh, with them too. So for example, uh, a half a year ago we had the biggest uh, outage in our history, affecting millions of users, uh, mostly in Europe, who couldn't be, yet log in and couldn't play songs for a few hours. Uh, and uh, what we did immediately was to invite everyone in the company for a big uh, half day or full day uh, post-mortem to discuss this and what we can do to, to avoid this in the future. Uh, this is preparing the post-mortem, this is not the entire company on the picture. <laughs> so, uh, and there's never about assigning blame. It's always focused on how can we improve uh, the way of working so that we can avoid things like this in the future. And uh, I don't know if that's typically Swedish, but I know that a, a lot of, of uh, people, we have people coming from all over the world, from about 40 different nationalities, just to work at, no, oh, it's a fly, sorry, uh, just to work at Spotify. We're very fortunate in that sense, but we also have a lot of different cultures, but something that uh, people from other countries notice is that uh, this is a really great thing about Spotify, that we, it's, you rarely get any blame or, or um, uh, managers uh, uh, yelling at you or anything. One team, for example, they did a release of Daft Punk, that's probably one of the biggest bands in the world right now, and they did their new uh, long awaited album. They were supposed to, they thought, okay, let's do a, you're, you're doing a campaign for that. Just do whatever you want, we give, we're given a great responsibility, and they messed it up big time. So actually, on the day of the launch, no one could access the album at Spotify. So quite the opposite of what was intended. And people were actually scared of, of the reactions. But everything that happened from management was, oh, this is really, really bad, so uh, how unfortunate. Let's make sure we, we don't do that again in the future. Uh, and just as long as you have a retrospective and a post-mortem, we're, we're fine. Learn from this. And our CTO keeps stressing that if we're not, if not 30%, of what we're doing is failing. We're not innovating enough. So there's a big support from, from management and the rest of the organization that it's okay to fail. We should, in fact, be failing, maybe more than we are, we are now. Some teams even have a ball of fails and, and very proudly put up uh, the mistakes they do just to encourage this kind of thinking. And we also try to work on improvement across the tribes. Uh, so we have a forum for, for continuous improvement where agile coaches, engineers and uh, tribe leads uh, and CTO meet to, to focus on the big things and we try to identify bigger themes that we want to be working for a long time. And, and, uh, I can't see any of them here, but one is uh, demographics and diversity, for example. So, uh, and this is another example, the twice the speed challenge. So what we did there was uh, a lot of people were complaining about we're growing so fast, we're so big, shouldn't we be faster at this size of a company? Uh, and of course, I would see that, that in, a, in a, another organization that might have taken, okay, we really have to do something about that, and now the, the management uh, start to bang the bang big drum and uh, say now everyone has to be faster. And uh, Of course, not everyone is slow or perceive themselves as slow, and probably it's not an uh, individual squad problem, it's more of a systemic improvement opportunities. 
So what we did was uh, management talked about this. So this has come to our attention. Uh, do you agree? Yes, a lot of people agree, but they didn't really know what to do about it. So let's let's start to actually measure what we're doing. The cycle cycle time challenge it was called, or the twice the speed challenge. So uh, by the end of the quarter, 80% of all squads uh, should have uh, should be measuring their cycle time. They should define what cycle time means to them, uh, and they should be thinking of ways to improve it, maybe by twice the speed. And it was posed as a challenge, and then uh, tribe leads, agile coaches, and chapter leads working with a squad uh, got together in a meeting with every squad, talked with them, and, and said, okay, so, so how do you see this challenge? And some teams said, we don't think it's a problem for us, but just to prove it, we're going to start measuring it, and then we'll see. Others said, yeah, we know it's a big problem, thank you for helping us, where, where can we start? So, and we, put, we uh, pulled in people that uh, could really help, that have done these kind of things before, we, we had the coaches help them with how they could measure cycle time, how they could possibly improve, uh, and so on. And a lot of it have been, like, just uh, losing up dependencies between teams, so they're no longer blocked, which has really increased speed. Uh, a lot of it has been the continuous delivery guild and, and focusing on continuous delivery and so on. And sometimes the squads that said, no, we don't think we're slow, they started measuring and they said, oh, okay, we're not so fast as we thought we were. We're going to speed things up. Okay, so that was actually all I wanted to talk about. I think I, uh, well, I worked in some time. It's actually 10.30. Uh, so it's time for a break, but uh, uh, if you want to, I'll be open to, to take some questions. Uh, and uh, I will also be here all day, all night, and just approach me if you have any comments or questions. Uh, I also have a, a Twitter handle, an uh, email address, a uh, website, and uh, also I want to finish with a, a, a shameless sales plug for uh, I'm finishing uh, these days I'm finishing a book for Manning called Kanban in Action, that's about Kanban. Maybe some of you went to the Kanban talk I did in Riga three years ago or something. Now it's finally a book, so please buy it or check it out. It's, it's available in an early access program at Manning.com. Okay, thank you.